Good evening, fantastic folks. Welcome back to another edition of Controversialism by Skipito Talks. Today, we are going to explore the economic impact of the British domination of India for 200 years. We will try to put a price on the amount of money that the British crown owes India. I will show you how a flourishing economy contributing to one third of the world's economy was reduced to just 2%. We will talk about how, despite any natural disasters, British policy created an anthropogenic famine which killed millions of Indians. We will also talk about the deindustrialization of India. We will talk about slavery and India's contribution to the world wars. Finally, I will give a reply to those who say that the British introduced in India the railways, civil services, and most of all, unity. I will shed light on that. And uh, finally, we will discuss about what we can do with all the money we get in the form of reparations. So welcome back, fantastic folks. Welcome back to another episode of Controversialism by Skipito Talks. Uh, today, let's talk about the British loot. Before India's subjugation at the hands of the British Empire, India was known as the golden peacock of the world or Sone Ki Chidiya as most of us know. Rightly so because in the 1700s, Indian economy was substantial. Scholars estimate that India's share in the global economy was around 27%, close to a third of the world's GDP. We had an advanced form of agricultural practice, trade was flourishing, and there was a huge demand for products that were made through India's cottage industry. Starting right from the time of the Mesopotamian Empire and also Rome, India had strong network of trade. Along with the routes like the Silk Road, there was a facilitation of ideas and culture along with the spices high quality textiles, precious stones, handicrafts and other expensive commodities that were made in India. Indian craftsmanship and artistic skills were renowned worldwide, especially in Indian textiles like muslin and fine cotton fabrics. It was reported that muslin saris could be pulled through a small ring, hence obviously they were highly sought after in the international market. These, along with the intricately woven silk fabrics, pottery, jewellery and metalworks of India were in high demand in the foreign markets. India's trade connection with Europe was through the Middle East, originating from the time of the Mesopotamian Empire and also the Indus Civilization, which dates back to prehistoric times. 
I am talking about 4,000 to 6,000 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. The Indus civilization was flourishing somewhere between 3,300 BC to 2,600 BC and was advancing into the new era. Even through the ocean, that is the Indian Ocean, the Indian subcontinent sea route was connected with the Arabian Peninsula, East Africa and beyond which was being used for trade and cultural exchanges. Our shipbuilding industry was very well known. We had superior craftsmanship and we had the advantage of better quality wood. Indian ships were so popular that the Britishers were actually thinking about getting their boats built in India. The average Indian ship used to last for more than 30 years compared to 6 years on average for European made ships. Moving on, India's fertile land and climatic variations supported a rich agricultural base, producing a variety of crops such as rice, wheat, spices, cotton, sugarcane and many other major fruits. This Indian agricultural excellence existed even way back in 9000 BC, compared to the same time when West Europe was transitioning from a hunter-gatherer society towards being a farming community. The method of agriculture, the techniques that were used like slash and burn, rudimentary irrigation and also a very ancient animal husbandry method was prevalent in West Europe, especially in the Dark Ages. India, during the same period from 9000 BC to 3000 BC, we were producing diverse agricultural products. The Indus civilization had advanced urban centers which, uh, which had sophisticated drainage system, indicating a high level of agricultural, architectural and economic development. Advanced urban centers with sophisticated drainage systems indicates a high level of agricultural development. Urban centers would only come up in a civilization if they had a strong crop output to feed their people. Crop surplus frees the mind of the population to pursue other skills which led to a shift from an agricultural to a manufacturing society. I am giving you a historical perspective because it helps introduce you to India's sophisticated, interconnected and largely advanced economy. To support this point, I would mention the urgency with which European traders tried to find a sea route to India since the Ottoman Empire started to levy high charges on trade transit through the Middle East. In fact, Vasco da Gama's sea route to India was a secret which was protected for 100 years. Nobody knew about it for 100 years. And all the major European uh, and all the major European powers like Dutch, French, British and Portuguese were attracted like a magnet to India's market. By the time Captain Hawkins came to meet India's emperor of the time, Jahangir, it was rumoured that the Mughal king had more wealth than all of the rulers of Western Europe combined. These facts and the sections coming up will help you decide if the British owe reparations to India. Keep in mind that the 200 years of British rule in India depreciated our global economic contribution from 27% to just 2%. Our agricultural heritage was systematically broken down and from 1850 to 1899, India faced 24 major famines. This is more than any other 50-year period in the world's entire history. These 50 years of famine killed an estimate 15 million Indians. Estimated 15 million Indians. This also reminds me of the time when British Prime Minister Winston Churchill's actions led to a devastating human tragedy. Bengal at that time was facing an anthropogenic famine during 1943 which led to the death of 3.8 million Indians, which is considered to be a low estimate due to biased reporting from the British administration. Let's spend some time on this part of the episode. The Bengal Chamber of Commerce was comprised of mainly British-owned firms, British-owned firms rather, 
with the approval of the governor of Bengal. They devised a foodstuff scheme which enacted preferential distribution of goods and services to employees with high priority roles such as the armed forces, war industries, civil servants and so-called priority class. So to prevent them from leaving their post, from leaving their jobs. I mentioned that this was an anthropogenic famine which simply means a famine that is primarily caused by human actions or activities that has no connection with natural disasters or environmental factors. Even now, in the modern world, we are seeing a condition of an anthropogenic famine in the Gaza Strip. Very surprisingly indeed. These human-induced famines happen due to complex factors which can be economic, political or social. Indian modern history is vast and it will be very difficult to summarize key events in history in a single episode, in a single video. Yet, till now, I have given you a perspective for the situation that prevailed. Just to summarize, the extremities of British nonchalance, lack of empathy and colonial or racial thoughts. I will quote Winston Churchill when a few sympathetic British officers informed the government that people in Bengal were dying due to starvation, malnutrition and disease in numbers bordering 3 million. The so-called champion of freedom and protector of democracy simply wrote in the margins of the report saying, if food is scarce then why hasn't Gandhi died yet? He wished for Gandhi to die and he was asking was there a dearth of food? since he was still alive. So he even said, and I quote again, I hate Indian people. They are beastly people with a beastly religion. This were his, his words. Perhaps he forgot that around 4 million Indian soldiers fought in both the world wars. The British Indian Army was the largest volunteering force at that time in history. He might have also overlooked that over 120 billion pounds in today's money were spent on war efforts, which came directly from India. India also sponsored vast amounts of food grains, raw materials, ammunition and weapons, along with uniforms and a lot more essential products that came from India's factories. All this happened while the peasants working in British factories could not even buy a day's worth of groceries with the wages that they were given. Inflation was high and the prices of essential commodities soared. The worst part was that while Bengal's population was worried about cannibalism, these food grains were kept as reserves for England. Most of the, uh, most of the grains actually perished while millions in India starved. I guess we should talk about the de-industrialization of India too, since that's one of the arguments that most people make. The handloom industry was flourishing when the British arrived at our ports. Indian textile industry contributed 25% of the world's production, which became 2% by the time India got its freedom. In the late 19th century, the handloom weaving industry declined significantly, with millions of weavers losing their jobs. British textiles flooded the market. They were cheaper mass-produced thanks to the industrialization of Europe. In fact, India was funding the European industrialization. Let me explain how it did. The British had Diwani rights in Bengal, meaning that they had the right to collect revenues. Plus, they were also getting war compensation from Indian rulers. They recycled India's money to buy Indian raw products to sell in the Indian market after being processed in Britain. Indians paid for their own subjugation through this system. Between 1815 and 1835, the number of Indian weavers declined from 6.27 million to 2.49 million. There was large-scale exploitation in British factories too. Wages were abysmally low and workers endured long hours without any extra incentives. The brutal working condition and the exhaustion led to many deaths. Plantation workers were malnourished and diseased 
but they still had to work while poverty and deprivation were rampant slavery in my view is no different in india as it was in africa well in the interest of time and your attention span let me declare that according to renowned economist utsa patnayak through her research in columbia university press the figure of reparations according to her is 45 trillion dollars at present this is 17 times more than the total gross domestic production of the united kingdom today do you know how much 45 trillion can actually do let's put it into perspective with a lot of examples and yes those who say that the british united india well from the start of the vedic age and going up to the size and scale of indian empires like the mauryan and the mughal empires there was a sense of bharat that existed we would have ourselves created a union like the european union if not a nation i will go into it more in my coming videos those who say that british gave us the railways and the civil services then my counter is that the railways at that time sped up the movement of goods which led to a more exploitation and civil servants of that time worked for british interests technology can be bought just like how many nazi scientists were brought by american research labs so with 45 trillion dollars we can buy industrialization on our own let me put it in perspective nasa's annual budget for fy22 was around 24.8 billion dollars with 45 trillion dollars india can fund nasa for over 1800 years we can fund nasa for over 1800 years number 2 Infrastructure development in America needs 2.6 trillion by 2029 estimated by the American Society of Civil Engineers with 45 trillion dollars from India we can fund all of US infrastructure projects for the next 17 years number 3 to eradicate global poverty and extreme poverty the world bank needs around 100 billion to 150 billion dollars according to their estimates With 45 trillion dollars India can end poverty and hunger for the next 300 years globally. Number 4 According to International Atomic Energy Agency the world needs an investment of 4 trillion dollars every year to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. With 45 trillion dollars India can fund this initiative for the next 11 years. The United Nations wants an annual investment of 29 billion dollars to provide global primary and secondary education and eliminate illiteracy. India with 45 trillion dollars can fund global education for the next 1150 years. Most importantly, the combined expenditure of all nations in a year is around 1.8 trillion dollars in the field of defense. India with 45 trillion dollars can fund an armed force equalizing all other nations funding for about 136 years imagine the armed force that you know the armed forces that we could create with all that money if anybody trolls india in the field of science and research then we could create 9400 individual projects that cost 4.7 billion dollars each which is compared to the large hydron collider we can have the same projects same 9400 projects so you might have noticed by now that i have tried to speed up my narrative and also keep my video shorter because long videos don't necessarily mean that you know i can hold the audience uh, attention for so long so i hope you learned a lot about uh, this brief session on how we come up to the figure of 45 trillion dollars which british owe us in reparations I know it's a ridiculous, uh, I, I, uh, ridiculous and ludicrous. Okay, it is a ludicrous um, estimate, which obviously the UK will not pay. It cannot pay, also, in fact. But again, I would say, if not the money, then a little bit of apology will still do. Thank you, fantastic folks. I hope you liked it. If you did, then please don't shy away from liking, subscribing, and sharing. if what you other youtubers say and uh, i will see you with a very interesting episode the next time so thank you fantastic folks see you again on the other side